BBC One, Patrick Moore visits the radio watchers in The Sky at Night. This is the NRAO, the National Radio Astronomy Observatory at Green Bank, West Virginia. There are several radio telescopes here in picturesque surroundings. There are three 85-foot dishes which work together. There's a 140-foot dish. And there used to be a 300-foot dish. But on the 15th of November, 1988, it suddenly collapsed and in a matter of seconds was completely destroyed. It's quite amazing that nobody was hurt. The loss of that telescope was a great pity. Because for one thing, it was a very famous radio telescope. In 1968, it was used to detect a pulsar inside the Crab Nebula. The Crab being the remnant of the supernova seemed to blaze out in the year 1054 and observed then by Chinese and Japanese astronomers. But astronomers at Green Bank were not daunted. They promptly set about planning a big new radio telescope. And as you can see, work has already started. I take it we now know why the old telescope collapsed. Yes, the 300 foot was built uh, around a box of large girders. And at the junction of each girder was a, a gusset plate, which served to stabilize the telescope. And as the telescope was driven back and forth across the sky, we estimate perhaps a million times, uh, the gusset plates were flexed until with metal fatigue, they finally cracked. And with the cracking of the gusset plate, the whole structure just uh, collapsed. What main advantages will the big new telescope have over the old one? When we started the design of the new telescope, we wanted to try to do something that would prove to be a serviceable instrument well into the next century. So we began by saying, let us have a, a, a telescope that has a clear aperture. That is, the radio signals can come to the surface and to the receiver without being reflected on the feed support legs that are characteristic of so many other telescopes. This will give us a very high gain and low noise telescope that's much more immune from interference, which is a problem here. In addition, it's mounted differently. Instead of a transit telescope, as the 300 foot was, or even an equatorial telescope mounted on one main bearing, the way the 140 foot is, this will be an altitude azimuth telescope mounted on track with wheels rotating about a central pintle bearing. Uh, will control the, the main thrust of it. What do you think is the main importance of modern radio astronomy? Well, uh, it gives you a different view of the physics of the, of the objects that we're looking at. Optical light, of course, is well known. It rises from atoms and, and uh, electrons. But the radio waves come from, from either very cold gas, for example, the hydrogen in the Milky Way that forms the, the, the material from which stars come, or very high energy particles that result from uh, great activity, the collapse of a star, a supernova, or a black hole in the center of a distant galaxy. The radio astronomy allows you to pick out these unique objects, which for a large part were hidden from optical astronomy. Remember, optical astronomy is very different from radio astronomy. Now and then, I still find people that say, can I look through a radio telescope? We need aperture. Ideally, we'd like a radio telescope about the size of England. Quite clearly, that's not practical. At present, the world's most powerful radio astronomy installation consists of not one telescope, but 27 dishes or antennae spread out on the plain of San Agustin in New Mexico. This is the VLA, or Very Large Array, and it's pretty impressive. When these 27 dishes are electronically connected, they synthesize a single dish 20 miles in diameter. I'm on one of the track arms of the VLA, and the system here is Y-shaped. There are three arms, southeast, southwest, and north. The first two are 17 miles long, and the north arm just under 12 miles. And uh, this is so the dishes can be moved around. At the moment, they're in what's called the D configuration, now as close together as they can ever get. If you want to use the optical counterpart of a zoom lens, you're going to go into what's called the A configuration. The dishes go out almost as far as the horizon, and the total crank length here is 85 miles. 
Now you don't do that every day because the antennae are pretty massive. In fact, each one weighs 235 tons with an 82-foot dish and towering 94 feet above the foundations. Why do you need so many dishes? And secondly, why are they arranged in a kind of Y formation? Hmm. Well, there's, there's two answers to why there are so many dishes. And the first one is very easy. More dishes is more sensitivity. The more collecting area, the more antenna surface, the more receivers, gives us more uh, antenna, more, more map sensitivity. And map sensitivity is one of the names of, of the game that we play here. The, uh, the signals that we are receiving are extremely weak, and we need all the collecting area and the best receivers possible. The other reason is a little more complex uh, to explain. It has to do with fidelity of imaging and, and speed of making maps. We do not observe like a single antenna would by scanning a region of the sky. We work by pointing all the antennas simultaneously to the same region and collecting information on a baseline by baseline, that is to say, pair by pair. Each pair contributes a little bit of information to the overall image. The more pairs, the more information. You can get this information with fewer pairs by observing for a longer time, but by having more pairs, you can get the information you need more quickly, and that gives you the argument for speed. To get back to your question of why it's a why, that's a matter of convenience. If you've got 27 antennas and you want to spread them around, having them in, set in, in general roadways is very expensive and very difficult to move. These antennas weigh 200 tons each. The better way to do it is to arrange them along straight lines, uh, where so you can use a rail car system uh, to pick up the antennas and move them long distances and plop them back down at some distant spot. So it was a matter of convenience. To give an optical analogy, when the dishes are close together as they are now, you're using them as a kind of wide angle lens. Yes, that's an analogy that is actually quite successful in explaining this. You can think of the array and its configuration as a zoom lens. And when the antennas are close together, you're in a wide angle mode. You're looking at larger areas, you lose fine scale detail. When the antennas are far apart, you're in a, in a, in a zoom mode where you narrow in on a smaller field, but you see things with much greater clarity. It's fair to say that in many ways, this is the most powerful and the most flexible insulation in the entire world. Oh yes, I think without any doubt, even our stiffest competitors will, will give us that. This array, because of its rescaling capability, because of the numbers of antennas that it's got, and because of the multiple bands that we can observe at, is, is clearly the most flexible and by almost any definition, the most powerful radio telescope in the world. Many lines of research are carried out by astronomers at the VLA, and much of the theoretical work is done nearby, here at Socorro. One investigation concerns jets in galaxies, and these indicate violent activity extending over immense distances, and studies of them give clues as to how galaxies work. Some of these jets can be observed at optical wavelengths, but they're best observed at radio wavelengths, and that's why the VLA is ideal for studying them. Well, jets are telling us that something very interesting is going on. In fact, they are pointers that show us phenomena in the universe that we can't tell is going on any other way. For example, this jet, which is coming out of the nucleus of M87, is really pointing to interesting activity in the nucleus of the galaxy. You can see this cone-shaped structure which is then centered on this point, this red point here, which is the nucleus of the galaxy, where some very interesting phenomena is taking place. Possibly a black hole? Quite possibly. That at least is a current theory which fits the observations. We cannot sh prove that it's a black hole, but it is, the observations are very consistent with that. That's a curious looking thing. What is it? Well, this is another example of the sorts of things we can only see with the VLA. This is a much larger system, um, hundreds of times the size of the previous object we were looking at. It consists of two jets, one of which is coming out of a nucleus in this position and running along this direction. The second nucleus is just above it in this position and producing this curved structure that you see to the north of the first object. The two jets are apparently interacting with one another and, as you can see, being bent by some phenomena. Now, why would they be bent in this particular way? You would think the two jets coming out at random would be bent in some random directions. But, in fact, you see both objects are being bent in the same direction. And we believe this is because that 
this, these jets are seeing the external medium in the cluster, and the external medium has motion in it, a wind. And so these jets are like smoke from a smokestack that are, in fact, bending due to the wind that's blowing in the cluster. I know that the Hubble Space Telescope have been studying these jets optically. How do the optical and the radio observations link together? Well, in this particular case, Hubble can't see the structures that we're looking at. In other cases, like M87, the emission also shows up in the optical band. And we can compare the emission in the two bands and learn about the physics of the source from that comparison. The VLA is really the only instrument that can produce images of this quality in the radio, images of the same quality as the Hubble Space Telescope. From some of the most remote objects to one much nearer home. The study of radio emission from the sun serves two broad purposes. First of all, the sun is of considerable interest in its own right, and radio waves originate in the outer atmosphere of the sun, and therefore serve as a very useful probe of physical conditions in the sun's outer atmosphere or phenomena which occur in the sun's at atmosphere, the most spectacular example being solar flares and associated phenomena. Uh, radio waves allow us to determine such useful physical parameters as the electron number density, the temperature of the material, and the magnetic field strength in the sun's atmosphere. But a second purpose of radio waves and uh, the study of the sun at radio wavelengths is the fact that conditions occur in the sun's atmosphere which are simply not duplicable in a laboratory environment. Therefore, the sun can be thought of as a very large astrophysical laboratory, which allows us to rigorously observe and test current theories of the physics of astronomical objects. What does radio astronomy tell us about solar flares? Well, a solar flare is a catastrophic release of energy in the low solar atmosphere, uh, which accelerates large numbers of particles to high energies, can lead to mass motions, and even the eje ejection of material from the sun. For example, here on the monitor display is an example of a flare which occurred in June 1989 during the solar maximum period, uh, which shows flare emission uh, at a wavelength of six centimeters. The brightness corresponds to a temperature uh, from particles of order uh, 300 million degrees, so they're very energetic indeed. At the beginning, we see that there is a single brightening which corresponds to a location over a sunspot. After some time, some tens of seconds, we see a second brightening, which corresponds to uh, a magnetic field of the opposite polarity, sort of the other side of the magnetic loop. And then as time progresses, we see energy propagate throughout the arch, bridging the two foot points of the flaring loop. How can you study the solar cycle at radio wavelengths? Well, in an indirect sense, we have several uh, features which we can track during the course of a solar cycle and which evolve during the course of a solar cycle. Now, what I show here on the left is the sun during the time of solar maximum, uh, specifically 1981. And on the right, I show an example of the sun during solar minimum. On the top is an image of the sun at a wavelength of 20 centimeters, as obtained with the VLA. And on the bottom, I show the corresponding optical image in the light of hydrogen. And one can see the active sun uh, shows two prominent belts of activity, uh, which is visible both in the optical and at the radio wavelengths. By the time we get to solar minimum in 1986, at optical wavelengths, the sun is essentially a naked sphere. Uh, but at, at uh, radio wavelengths, uh, it shows many more features. Why is the VLA so useful for studying the sun? Ironically enough, the VLA was never designed to observe the sun, but hardware modifications were made to enable us to do so. The VLA is useful for observing the sun for the same reason it's extremely useful for observing all other cosmic objects. It allows us to image directly with an unprecedented level of detail and at a large number of wavelengths, physical phenomena of interest on the solar surface. Uh, but because the sun is so nearby, it's a mere 150 million kilometers distance, uh, it enables us to study structures as small as 100 kilometers uh, near the sun's surface. One particular galaxy has been showing some very interesting emissions. M81 is telling me how these beautiful spiral arms are formed in a galaxy. How are they? In this case, the spiral arms in M81 are probably formed by the nearby galaxy M82, which is actually causing a, a gravitational tide. The top of the picture is primarily red, and that part of the galaxy is red shifted. It's moving away from us. The bottom is primarily blue, and it's blue shifted, 
it's moving toward us. And the smooth grade of color from red at the top to blue at the bottom shows the rotation of this galaxy. That is, the, the disk is moving away from us at the top and toward us at the bottom. How do you get Doppler shifts by radio astronomy methods? We measure the Doppler effect by tuning the radio receivers to different frequencies, which is the same as different velocities. This is a movie made of the individual frequency tunings of the radio receivers. And with each tuning, we look at a different part of the galaxy and a different part of the rotation. Here at, at the top of the screen in the beginning of the sequence is the red shifted hydrogen. And we move along one tuning at a time down to the blue shifted hydrogen. Here you can see the segments of the spiral arms and in the center you'll see a spot marking the middle of the galaxy. And the color map that we saw earlier is essentially a sum of all these individual pictures. Expanding galaxies can also show the Doppler effect. Uh, this galaxy it shows red and blue at the top and bottom, but it also shows red and blue close to each other near the center which is showing us the expansion. Two astronomers have been using the VLA to study that mysterious region, the center of our galaxy. Uh, Dr. Junhui Zhao and uh, myself, we've both been uh, working on different studies of the center of our galaxy uh, using observations at the VLA. Um, here's a, uh, an image of the galactic center region. And uh, one intriguing question, uh, like the sun very definitely marks the center of our solar system, what is the center of our galaxy? Visually, of course, you can't see it at all. That's correct. The, um, the optically, there's a tremendous amount of obscuration uh, between the Earth and the center of our galaxy, so at visual wavelengths you see nothing. But uh, this dust and gas does not uh, impede radio waves. So with instruments like the VLA, we can make radio images of the center of the galaxy and get a look at, uh, at what's lying in there. This is a uh, radio image uh, of what we call the Sagittarius uh, uh, A uh, region. It's about 10 light years from top to bottom. And in particular, let me point out this uh, quite bright feature which we call Sagittarius A star. It's a uh, very bright, very compact radio uh, feature and is a good candidate for the center of our galaxy. Let me point out another object down here. This is another compact, uh, quite bright radio source. It rivals in brightness Sag A star, but this object wasn't there before uh, December of 1990. It's a uh, transient object, a completely new object that suddenly appeared uh, in our image. Dr. Zhao, what do you think this transient source is? This transient source is a, a radio compact source, and which is uh, uh, indicate a large amount of high-speed electrons uh, spiraling around the magnetic fields. And the nature of this source is, uh, is quite difficult to determine for this moment. Uh, but based on the, on the measurement and observations we have, and uh, this source likely associated with a binary system. One of the most uh, intriguing questions about Sagittarius A star is, what is the true dynamic center of the galaxy? Is it this very bright uh, radio compact object, or is it something else in the area? So we've been making repeated VLA observations, images of this object, with respect to a few background quasars. And we've been seeing the radio source slowly move across the sky. Now this is a very small movement, 5 milli arc seconds, 5 thousandths of an arc second per year. But we, we can see this motion with the VLA, and that's exactly what you would predict from the 250 million year rotation period of the galaxy. So it could be the actual central object. This is, this is uh, an experimental evidence that, that supports that. This is the Kitt Peak National Observatory in Arizona. It's known mainly for its optical work, but here too there's a 12 meter radio telescope. Is it a high, dry site? And this helps the work being done here. This telescope operates at very short wavelength, down to about one millimeter. 
the Earth's atmosphere, unfortunately, absorbs signal coming in from the cosmos. And the higher that we can get, the better science that we can do. The cornerstone discovery of millimeter wave astronomy was made with this telescope in 1970. That was the, the discovery of carbon monoxide in space. That discovery has allowed us to study the way that stars are formed, the way that stars die, the structure of our own galaxy, and the structure of other galaxies. It is the essential result of millimeter wave astronomy that we can study this cold, dark matter in our galaxy and other galaxies. Does this telescope always work on its own, or can you link up with other radio telescopes, such as the VLA, for example? From time to time, we participate in millimeter wavelength very long baseline interferometry, VLBI. When we do that, we participate with a number of other telescopes ranging from Europe, the United States, and Japan, all of which can work at the short wavelengths that this telescope operates at. The, uh, this consortium of observatories currently has the record for the highest angular resolution, that is the smallest detail that, is, that has been detected so far, and that's about 50 micro arc seconds. If our eyes could resolve at that level, we would be able to read a newspaper in London while standing in New York. The next step is to take radio telescopes in different places and make them work together. This is done in the project known as VLBA, or Very Long Baseline Array. And this uses dishes in places as far apart as Hawaii and the Virgin Islands. This is one of the dishes, 25 meters across. Every station has its own particular clock. And I don't mean an ordinary clock, a hydrogen maser clock. And the accuracy has to be truly amazing, something like a millionth of a millionth of a second. Finally, the results are taken to Socorro for analysis. Its principal advantage is that uh, it's the first dedicated very long baseline interferometer. Uh, once it's working properly, it will be working 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Uh, it's an extension of the, of the VLA to much larger baselines. And it will provide us with very high resolution pictures of radio sources. What do you think the main scientific results are going to be? We expect there to be a lot of results um, on uh, jets in radio sources, getting uh, observations of very fine detail, looking at the motions, the superluminal motions of, of knots along jets. Uh, there should be plenty of monitoring observations of things such as the, the flaring of, of radio stars. Is there any limit to the size? For example, could you link up with a radio telescope in space? Well, there are already plans to do so. Uh, the Russians and the Japanese plan to launch small radio telescopes uh, in the late 90s. And we are already talking with them about linking up with those antennas. Radio astronomy is a young science. It began in the early 1930s with some work by Carl Jansky, an American radio engineer who was studying static. And look at this curious contraption. Here, back at Green Bank, we have a replica of the first radio telescope ever made, constructed by Jansky and not intended to be a radio telescope at all. The wheels came from an old dismantled Ford car, but he found he was picking up radio waves from the Milky Way, and that was the start of it all. Today, radio astronomy has become one of the most important branches of modern science, and with the great radio telescope we've seen, we can now study objects at the very boundary of the accessible universe. Thank you.